Hello everyone, welcome to our fifth online workshop. Unbelievable to think we've done that many already. Um, it was such a, so amazing to see such a great response from our hearing and genetics workshop. Um, I can't wait to introduce our Allport experts who are going to be talking to you about the genetics uh, of Allport syndrome and they'll be talking to you shortly. Okay, without further ado, uh, I think you've heard enough from me. Let's start with the first of our speakers, Konstantinos. Would you mind sharing your screen, please? And if you'd unmute as well, I think you... I'm not sure if you're muted. Yeah, can, you, can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Um, can't quite see the presentation yet. Uh, I did share. We're looking at your desktop right now. I can't see the presentation. Is the PowerPoint is PowerPoint open? Yes, it is in the in the PowerPoint mode, and the option I see at at, at the top of the screen is to stop share. Um, would you have you put PowerPoint in uh, full screen? Yes. Oh, that is odd. Okay. Um, is it, have you got two screens? Is it maybe sharing a different screen to, um... Yeah, but I did have two screens before when we, when we did the, 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 the hair cell. Okay, that is weird. Um... Okay, let me, let me move it to the other screen, just in case. Yeah, sure, we're just saying desktop right now, that's all. Let me, let me see. <laughs> you see, <laughs> you can always run into trouble. <laughs> ah, no worries. Ah, there we go. That looks perfect. Do, do you see it now? Yeah, we can see it perfectly. Although it's not in the, it's not in the, or it's not in the full screen. But let me see if we can make it full screen. Okay. Um. Go to the far left of that menu from beginning. Yeah. No, usually I did from the if you from the bottom right. Uh, you I nearly had it. You when I said far left, you there we go. Perfect. And then go remember like we talked about, go to display settings. And okay. so, so now you can see it? We can see it fine, yes. Um you just need to go to display settings above the picture of your face. Um, and hit switch. There we go. Swap? Absolutely, yeah. There we go. Technical issues over. Fantastic. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> okay, thanks for the excellent instructions, uh, Patrick. <laughs> uh, uh, I am Constantine Deltas from Cyprus. Uh, it, it's a real pleasure to be here and uh, sharing this opportunity to communicate with many people. Um, Okay, uh, well, I, I live in a small island in the Mediterranean by the name Cyprus, if you don't know it. And we've been working on Alpha Syndrome for quite some time. Uh, we, we've been trying to understand how this interesting disease works. And even though it's a very old disease, uh, it keeps surprising us. And this is what I am going to present very briefly tonight. Uh, uh, we, we had a recent case of a patient who um, presented in a very peculiar way, which I'm going to describe to you. Before I do that, let me just say a, a couple of more words on what we do in Cyprus. Uh, we, we are a lab interested in inherited kidney disorders, and we've been, we've been working on several of them, uh, including cystic kidney disorders. And for the past many years, more than 15 years, we've been working on Alpha syndrome and thin basement membrane nephropathy, which is a related disease, actually. Even though we are a small island and a small country with a population of less than a million people, we have many hundreds of patients. Um, okay. Um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Odiadis, is going to present our work on and the mouse model we have. So let me concentrate on this one case we had recently, which I found interesting and I decided to share with you when Susie asked me whether I had something to 
prepared. Okay, um, let me see if I can go to the next slide. Okay, so a, a few months ago, we were asked by the local hospital, the Nicosia General Hospital, the transplantation unit, to assist them with the case of a patient who was being evaluated for transplantation. He is 55 years old. He was born in 1964. And he reached end stage kidney disease uh, two or three years ago. He was on dialysis. And then his sister, uh, who is, uh, I think she's uh, slightly younger, uh, was interested, in, actually he, she's slightly older, she was interested in donating her kidney. The, the fa there was no family history of chronic kidney disease. There was no, the, 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 the all-port diagnosis was not evident anywhere in the family. And it was just a patient, a male patient, who for some reason reached end-stage kidney disease. He was being evaluated for transplantation and nothing more than that. So when his sister expressed interest in donating her kidney to his brother, of course, she went through some evaluation. During the evaluation, they found that she was matching. She had a good match to be a donor, but she also found to have microscopic hematuria. And she was sent to us. Uh, we are a referral center. Therefore, she was referred to us to investigate it further knowing that she, um, she has microscopic hematuria, and microscopic hematuria is something we've been studying for many, many years, including, of course, our procedure. Um, now, the interesting thing about the patient, her brother, was that she ha he had diabetes. So the obvious diagnosis was that he had diabetic necropathy, and that's why he had reached end-stage kidney disease a couple of years earlier. Um, he also had some ocular neuropathy and he was taking insulin since 2009 at the age of 45. Uh, he had a high blood pressure since the age of 48. Um, as I said, he was diagnosed with diabetic neuropathy. He used to smoke a lot. He used to smoke 40 cigars per day until three years ago. And and as I said, his, uh, his sister was evaluated for microscopic chemotherapy. Like many other labs in, around the world, we have a panel of genes, including the collagen genes, that we test by next generation sequencing for mutations. So we put her sample to our panel, and we found a mutation in the call for A5 gene. The call for A5 gene is an X linked gene, mutations in which are responsible for the X-linked alpha syndrome. So for those who don't know a lot about genetics, people who have this mutation, uh, mostly males, have severe disease. So this is a disease which is inherited usually from, from mothers to their sons. And there is no male-to-male -male transmission. Okay, so uh, th this sister had this one mutation in call 45. Being a female, she's heterozygous. That means we don't expect her to have a severe disease, but because of this one mutation, she has this microscopic hematuria. We were really struck to find this because we were not aware of any outward family history uh, in, 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 in this family. Now, what made this, um, this case interesting was that when we tested her brother, who is being evaluated for transplantation, he had the same mutation. Nobody ever suspected that he had Alport syndrome. And as I said before, with this mutation, he was expected to have a severe disease since his early life. Instead, he had nothing more than um, uh, high uh, blood sugar since his early life. In fact, for some reason, which is still interesting to in in investigate further, he had high blood sugar since his early 20s. 
So he had this diabetic disease for many, many years, and perhaps this is why in his 50s, he ended up with diabetic nephropathy. But now he also has awkward. With this one mutation, he's diagnosed with Alpha syndrome. And therefore, we are interested in um, investigating further other members in the family to see whether they have this same, same mutation. And therefore, they are at high risk for uh, microscopic hematuria, proteinuria, and Alpha syndrome. Uh, the father of these two guys uh, is 84 years old. He has type 2 diabetes and Alzheimer's. Okay, it's not surprising. Also, the mother is 84 with hypertension and coronary artery disease, and one brother died at 52 with aortic aneurysm. The rupture one aortic aneurysm. Now, why did I think this is an important case to present? I thought it was an important case to present for two reasons. One I mentioned already, one I'm going to mention uh, briefly. So the first reason is that this guy is 55 years old now. We think he ended up on dialysis because of diabetic nephropathy. But to tell you the truth, I am not sure if it's only because of diabetic nephropathy or it's because of alcohol. With this one mutation we found, being an X-linked disease, we expected him normally to uh, to resolve to output in his early 20s or 30s. He never had any medication which is normally given to people with auto syndrome, ACE inhibitors or something like that, or ARBs. Now, from the molecular perspective, the interesting case, which I'm sure the nephrologists in the panel will find very interesting, is that the mutation we thought we had found, and I say, and I emphasize we thought, we have found was a deletion of exon 5. A deletion of exon 5, we, for those who do not understand molecular genetics, is supposed to be a very severe mutation. We did what we call in our language MLPA, which is a specific uh, method which allows us to identify gross deletions in the gene. Uh, and with this method MLPA, we found a deletion of exon 5. But then we didn't like something about it. And when we did further testing to see why uh, MLPA showed deletion of exon 5, we found that exon 5 was not deleted. It was there. Using a different method, we found that the exon 5 was not absent. It was there. And what we discovered was something that may be interesting to the wider. Uh, nephrology community actually, and this is why I thought it's interesting to share with you. We found that there is one variant on exon 5 which is probably responsible for the fact that the primers, the DNA primers that we use for testing for MLPA, it's right exactly where the variant is. So we assume that because of the variant sitting exactly where the primer is supposed to be, what is a primer? It's one of those tools that we use for testing for big deletions in the gene. And therefore, it gave us the false impression that the exon 5 was missing. Doing DNA sequencing, we identified two additional single point mutations, which most probably are responsible for the all phenotype and the microscopic hematuria in the family. So, this is the the uh, pedigree of the family. I don't know if you can see my, uh, my pointer. If you don't, the gray square shows the male who is being evaluated for transplantation. And the circle with the dot in the circle is his sister uh, who presented with microscopic hematuria. And therefore, we are now going to test here three uh, daughters because every one of them has a 50% chance of having inherited the mutation and therefore run a risk for microscopic hematuria and proteinuria and perhaps um, kidney dysfunction later in their life. The same goes for the daughter of the affected male. Uh, his daughter is definitely the carrier of this one uh, mutation and also at high risk for microscopic hematuria and proteinuria. 
So the, the lesson we are learning from this case is that it may, it may be a rare event, but we know that the human genome is full of many DNA variants. So it just, it just so happened in this case that this one variant was sitting right where the primer for the MFPA testing is sitting, and it prevented this one primer from sitting there and gave the false impression of a deletion. This deletion, as I said at the beginning, is expected to be a very severe mutation, which is expected to be associated with very early and severe OPPO syndrome. But even the point mutation we found is also responsible for normally severe early onset microscopic hematuria and proteinuria. With this in mind, we plan to communicate with the company who made these tools for mutation detection and let them know to um, design new primers, new tools for testing for Exxon 5 because just like we found this error, many other people may have found this error and gave a false diagnosis. This is our fear, that we, we run the risk of giving a false diagnosis of all for syndrome why it could have been something, something, something else. So in conclusion, I find it really interesting and disappointing that people end up on dialysis because of all syndrome at the age of 55 being undiagnosed. And unfortunately, this is not the only case. I know that other people have similar experience, um, but this sh should not happen. I mean, this guy must have had microscopic hematuria since early life, and for some reason, he remained undiagnosed. So let me end this here. If, if there are any questions, I would be glad to answer. I really appreciate um, you starting us off with a, a really interesting talk. Um, we, we, we perhaps talk about this being a, a slightly weird case. Um, to what extent is there a, a typical presentation of Allport syndrome? Would there be very um, specific, specific hallmarks which keep coming up again um, that would be perhaps an easier case to diagnose um, you know, in, a, in an ideal world? Well, the, the thing is that we, we know that there is a, a very broad spectrum of phenotype mm -hmm. in people with all syndrome. And, and, and I refer to the classical all syndrome caused by mutations in this X-linked gene. I don't mean the thin bed membrane nephropathy, which, which we know now many adult nephrologists also call it um, all syndrome. This is the X-linked form is supposed to be the classical, typical, Allport, which is expected to present with severe disease very early on. Of course, we know there are occasions where mild mutations, like, like the famous 624 in the COL45 gene, presents with milder phenotype. Uh, but okay. it, it, it's not a very frequent event. So with sure. this one patient, really, we, I normally I expected that he would, he would have been diagnosed during his 20s. And mm. we did have, we did have uh, this technology available even 20 years or 30 years ago. Yeah. And, and you know, raise the flag in the family that something is running from one generation to the next. Qu Here question. we are with his sister being affected. Rachel, Rachel Lennon rightly asks if there was a history of hearing issues in the male patient as well. And, and a question from me, really, whether there was um, so development so of eye issues as well. Whether there was hearing issues in the male patient. Hearing issues? I, I, I don't know. Uh -huh. I don't know. Uh -huh. I, only, I only know he was a heavy smoker. I, I asked for more uh, clinical data. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's all I got. Oh, fair enough. Um, well, I, I am, I'm, uh, I'd love to ask more, but I think we're very conscious of time. Francis, have you got anything that you'd like to ask Constantinus? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> go, go for it, go for Can it. Can you hear me? 
Okay, Constantinus, that's a really interesting case um, for two reasons. One, because it reminds us of the challenges of so often making a diagnosis when people don't present in a completely typical way. And secondly, because it's just one very good example of how often doing genetic testing doesn't lead you to a quick and easy answer. And uh, it's important that people understand that. So you said this chap's got a, a variant that um, in exon 5, although the MLPA led you to think it was a deletion when in fact it isn't. And you said he's also got two other point mutations. Of those three, which one do you think is actually causing his all points? Yeah, thank you, Francis. Well, actually, maybe I, I misspoke. We found two in total uh, variants. One is this one on exon 5, which they gave the false impression for the deletion. And, and I'm sure for people who understand genetics like you and, and, and molecules can understand why this can happen. Absolutely. Actually, this is the second occasion it happened to, in my career. The, the, the first one was with another gene, uh, with, uh, which is responsible for the familiar Mediterranean fever. And we, we had exactly the same scenario where because of a variant sitting on top of the primer position, the, the PCR did not work to amplify the, the, mm. the, the gene. So it, this, this is a variant which is not a glycine. It, it's at the very beginning of the, of the gene. The second variant, it's an exon 6, actually, very close to exon 5. And that's why we could, we could sequence them in one go. The, the distance between the two variants is only, uh, uh, it's only 100 and 37 nucleotides, I think, because it just so happens that the, that the intron in between, intron 5, the non-coding region, is very small. It's one of those rare occasions in collagen genes that the exon is very small. I think it's only 90, I mean, the intron is very small. I think it's about 90 nucleotides. And the distance between the two variants is 127. Therefore, we could get it in one sequencing uh, reaction. So do you think, has, either, has either of those variants been reported in any of the databases? Has anybody else no, reported either of them? No, and, and that's the interesting thing. Uh, we couldn't find it anywhere. Uh, in fact, I was checking it again right before this uh, presentation. I could not find it in the ClinVar. I could not find it in the Varsam. And in the Gnomad has not been ever reported. So, so would we, it be we are... So would it be fair to say at the moment you've got two variants in Col4A5 that you looked at because there's a sister with hematuria, but we don't yet know whether this chap's got any hearing problems or any eye problems. So slightly playing devil's advocate here, we can't be completely sure that this is Allport syndrome, although it would be fascinating if it were because he's got to such a relatively advanced age without developing renal failure. So I wonder whether something like looking at RNA, looking at using hair roots to look at RNA would help tell you which part of the protein is missing and help confirm whether or not this really is an unusually late presentation of all ports. Is it just yeah. possible that these variants are a red well, actually, actually, he did have ocular neuropathy. I, I don't know exactly what, but this is what I, I received from the report of the doctor that this patient did have ocular neuropathy, um, but no, no hearing loss. Uh, the two variants, none of them is a glycine, okay. They are very, very rare. Um, I think the, the one variant, uh, yeah, I, I think you can, you can see this se sequencing, right? The one variant is a uh, aspartic acid to tyrosine in exon 6, which is, but chemically speaking, is a serious mutation. And the other one on exon 5 is uh, leucine to valine. Um, I don't know. I mean, if, for this kind of changes, you would expect, if, if, it, was not, if, if, it, was not, if it was not a quadrivalent mutation, to have some uh, reasonable sequence uh, frequency in the general population. Uh, we, we are not done with it. We are planning to do at least 100 Cypriot healthy people to see whether it's a private Cypriot polymorphism not found any, anywhere else. We, 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 I wouldn't be surprised 
if it has a high frequency in the Cypriot population. Uh, but to be honest, I, I'm almost certain it is, a, it is the cause of the, of the phenotype. If I find something else, I will let you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, because I, it's, it's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. In an ideal world, we would be running genetic testing on whole populations of people with unexplained kidney failure to try and find out in what proportion of them there is a genetic contribution. But what your presentation beautifully illustrates is that you can find variants in the DNA and be very tempted to conclude that they may be the cause of the problem or a significant contributor to it. But at the moment, we don't have definitive proof, do we? Unless we can establish that there is yeah. um, an abnormal no, we, RNA product being made. Well, it, it, it's present in two siblings. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I would definitely not say 100% certain. Okay. I mean, let, 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 let me clear. If it's mm. I'm just trying to evaluate and draw conclusions based on what we have. So you have two siblings and brother and sister who have these two variants. Um, the, the one of the two variants, the one on exon six, it's classified by Vartam as likely pathogenic. And some of the, you know, among the many, many tools that one can look, you know, those, all, all those, uh, um, all, uh, in silicon tools that we all use, some of them give it out as damaging. Uh, Exxon, the one in Exxon 5, it's also been given by several tools as damaging, with some others as likely pathogenic, some others benign. So it, it, there's no certain uh, absolute conclusion, but it, it has not been excluded entirely that it could be uh, pathogenic. It's difficult to evaluate it based on pure uh, biochemistry uh, because there is no functional test and because it's a loose into value. Okay, so after we do uh, about 100 or so healthy people in our population, if we don't find it at all, I would definitely add to my, uh, to my inclination to say that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pathogenic. So, so the very um, valid point you're making is that if a variant is very rare, it's more likely to be significant. Whereas if it's something that you see commonly in your particular local population, then it's more likely just to be a normal variant. Constantinus, that was really interesting. I'm conscious of the fact that yours is the first of just four presentations. You and I could carry on discussing this all evening. Um, but I think we'd better stop to allow a bit of time for some of the other people. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much, you. Konstantinos. Would you mind uh, stopping sharing your screen? Uh, perfect. Um, I've just got an eye to our Cyprian colleagues, Francis, who I think will be uh, wrapping up quite late if we, uh, if we don't get a bit yes. of a move on. Mamita, I believe it's your turn now. I see you're unmuted. Um, are you there? You yep. You yep, we can hear you perfectly. Um, go ahead. Uh, thanks, and uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, to give this talk and I'm going to speak about the variability in the clinical presentation in Alport syndrome which I think dovetails quite nicely with uh, Professor Deltas's uh, presentation that he just gave and I hope by the conclusion of the presentation you'll understand uh, why I decided to talk about this as well. But I first want to start by going over a a uh, brief historical overview of how our understanding with respect to the genetics of Alport syndrome has evolved over time. And we now know that there are three forms of Alport syndrome, and they are completely identical in their clinical manifestations, but where they differ is in the genes that cause them. So one of the very first reports of Alport syndrome was by Dr. Cecil Alport, where he described this multi-generational family with multiple affected family members, and he noticed that males had more severe disease than the females. And um, unfortunately, the males passed away at early ages of kidney failure because this was at a time where dialysis and transplantation was not available. We now know that this is a family with X-linked Alport syndrome as a result of mutations on the collagen 4-alpha-5 gene. This is one of the forms of Alport syndrome. And 
when we look at our DNA, we all have 23 pairs of chromosomes that are called autosomes. And each pair is inherited from mom, and the other part of the pair is inherited from dad. Additionally, we all have a pair of sex chromosomes. In females, it's XX. And on, in males, it's XY. And collagen 4 alpha 5 is a gene that's on the X chromosome. In 1994, two additional genes were identified as causing Alport syndrome. That these genes are named collagen 4 alpha 3 and collagen 4 alpha 4. These are uh, genes that are located on chromosome 2. Chromosome 2 is an autosome. Um, therefore, there is no difference in the clinical presentation between males and females. So, as has also been alluded to in, uh, by Dr. Uh, by Professor Deltas, um, genetics technology has advanced significantly since uh, the discovery of Alport syndrome or the description of Alport syndrome and its genes. And in particular, over the past 20 years, there has been tremendous advances in genetics technology such that now we can do genetic testing in patients. Um, and as a result of increased genetic testing, so too has evolved in terms of our understanding of the clinical variability that we see within Alport syndrome. So on one end, we can see patients who have uh, mutations in one of these type four collagen genes who present with mild disease, for instance, just uh, isolated blood in the urine called hematuria, that does not progress on to kidney failure. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have more classic forms or more severe forms of disease where individuals will have kidney abnormalities and kidney failure, hearing and eye abnormalities. And uh, in between uh, is an entity called adult onset FSGS, which I consider moderate form of disease. And I'll get into that in a subsequent slide. With respect to what actually influences this genetic variability or this uh, clinical variability, we know that there are some genetic factors that actually influence the clinical variab variability. So if we looked at X-linked Alport syndrome, um, females have two X chromosomes. And in a female who has one mutation uh, in the collagen 4 alpha 5 gene, this individual would have, or this female would have milder disease. And the reason for that is because uh, females have this other X chromosome without the mutation that balances or compensates for the other chromosome. Males will have only one X chromosome. And so if that, if that chromosome has the mutation in it, they don't have another Y, they don't have another X chromosome rather to compensate. And so males with uh, X-linked Alport syndrome have more classic manifestations or more severe manifestations comparatively to females. So the same type of principle applies to the non-sex-linked or autosomal types of Alport syndrome due to, college, due to mutations in collagen 4-alpha-3 and collagen 4-alpha-4. So if you have an individual, regardless of if they're male or female, who has one mutation, but the other copy of the chromosome does not have the mutation, then this individual will have milder disease. By contrast, an individual who has two copies of the mutation will have uh, more classic forms of the disease that would be uh, similar to males with X-linked uh, Alport syndrome. One caveat that I want to say is that when I say milder disease, it, with respect to kidney manifestations, it does not necessarily mean that an individual won't develop, for instance, kidney failure. But the onset of kidney failure or when kidney failure occurs might be markedly delayed compared to someone who has the classic form. So for instance, Professor Deltas's example that he gave of an individual who developed kidney failure at age 58, that would be considered milder. Another um, aspect that influences um, clinical variability uh, or that spectrum of disease is the type of mutation. So genes encode for proteins, and proteins are the basic elements of cells that carry out the cellular function. If you have a mutation that leads to a substitution of the building block within the protein, 
but preserves the length of the protein. This is a very subtle effect on the protein. It's called a missense mutation, and it leads typically to milder disease. If you have a mutation that shortens the protein or actually deletes part of the protein, these are called nonsense mutations and deletions, and they lead to more classic forms of the disease. So my own research background has been to try to understand genetic factors in a kidney disease called focal and segmental glomerular sclerosis, or what we abbreviate as FSGS. And this is really just a pattern of injury that we observe in the kidney under light microscopy, characterized by scarring in part of the kidney filter. Uh, and the kidney filter is this circle here called the glomerulus. It is the leading cause, or not leading, but it is one of the major causes of um, kidney failure in adults. So in Toronto, in the hospital that I work at, uh, we have collected DNA samples belonging to adults with FSGS since 2004. And when I started in 2015, I took some of these samples and I performed what we call whole exome sequencing in them. That's where we sequence the coding regions of all genes in the body. And uh, to my surprise, the leading cause of, uh, the leading genetic cause, I should say, the leading genetic cause of adult onset FSGS in our cohort was unrecognized Alport syndrome. And so what we did is we took these cases uh, of unrecognized Alport syndromes that had been previously labeled as FSGS and we looked at their biopsy samples where available, because this is a historic cohort, meaning that these patients weren't necessarily actively being followed uh, at the time when we did our study. And when we looked at these pathology slides, we found that indeed these patients did have the scarring that's characteristic of FSGS, but they also had features of classic Allport syndrome on pathology. So the classic uh, findings on pathology is basement membrane, ab what we call basement membrane abnormalities, and we certainly observe that in most of these cases of unrecognized Alport syndrome. The reason th these features were uh, not considered in the original diagnosis is because of the rest of the clinical presentation. These individuals uh, might have not had family histories, they were presenting quite late than the typical or the classic forms of Alport syndrome. They didn't have the obvious extra, uh, extra kidney features such as hearing and eye problems. When we looked at their clinical characteristics of this subgroup of unrecognized Alport syndrome, we found that their average age of kidney failure was 58 years, which is much later than what has been described in the literature. And we also found that most of these individuals had only one copy of the mutation, not two copies, which would explain why it was milder. Um, as well, for those individuals that had X-linked Alport syndrome, we had a significant number of those patients. Well, I shouldn't say significant because it's a small number still, uh, but a number of those patients were females rather than males. Our uh, re results were published in CJSON, and there's also an accompanying podcast where we describe our results. We have had this recurrent theme of identifying collagen mutations in um, families where we would not expect it, uh, where we would not expect it. I won't go into that unless there's questions after. But I will go into why the diagnosis matters. Why is it important to distinguish FS, FSGS from Allport syndrome. Well, the diagnosis actually influences our monitoring and treatment plans. It informs family planning and counseling. And if we have a genetic or a molecular diagnosis, we can screen relatives for early diagnosis and early treatment or early intervention. And we can also screen relatives for suitable kidney donors. The treatment of FSGS and Alport syndrome is, this, is overlapping, but it also differs. So for so-called idiopathic FSGS, we treat with months-long treatments of steroids, which is associated with significant toxicity like um, uh, swelling of the face and the, um, and, the, um, and the legs, diabetes, high blood pressure, immunosuppression. 
And so we don't want to give steroids unnecessarily, and we know that steroids is not useful for all port syndrome. What is useful for all port syndrome is early intervention with blockade of the renin angiotensin system using medications like, um, like Ramapril, like Corindopril, also known as Coversil and Altase. There are many medications in this class. Having a genetic diagnosis or a molecular, or what we call molecular diagnosis also informs with respect to family planning and counseling. So I'm not gonna go through all the possibilities, but for instance, if you have a, uh, a female who has one mutation uh, of the collagen 4-alpha-5 gene, in the collagen 4-alpha-5 gene, this female has 50% chance of passing on this X chromosome to a daughter who would then have this same genotype shown here. This female also has 50% chance of passing on this X chromosome to a son, who would then have this genotype here and would be affected. And so knowing the molecular diagnosis or the genetic diagnosis also opens up opportunities such as what we call pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, where you can test embryos for the genetic diagnosis prior to implantation uh, if doing IVF or in vitro fertilization. And you can also test uh, embryos in utero during pregnancy. So the question has already come up in the discussion about who should get genetic testing. Now the cost of genetic testing have, have fallen significantly, though it is not uh, trivial. Um, in Canada, we are fortunate that uh, in our clinic, we are able to get genetic testing for nearly everyone that we apply for. And I'm in the hereditary kidney disease clinic and we uh, offer genetic testing to everyone, um, including those individuals without a family history. So I would say ideally genetic testing, uh, as, Dr., as uh, Professor Flinter has also uh, mentioned, in any with, anyone with unexplained chronic kidney disease or anyone with unexplained FSGS. But if genetic testing is not that accessible, for, uh, which it is not uh, for in many areas, uh, in, many er in many countries in the world, then I would say that uh, anyone with uh, evidence of abnormal glomerular basement membranes on biopsy, because as I said earlier, most of our FSGS cases that were actually unrecognized all port syndrome had abnormal glomerular basement membranes, but it was felt to be inconsequential or secondary uh, to another phenomenon as a result of the rest of the clinical picture, which might have not been consistent with classic Alport syndrome. Um, and so if genetic testing confirms Alport syndrome, obviously you treat as Alport syndrome. But genetic testing is not a black or white picture. There's a lot of areas of gray in between. And so if you get a change in the DNA sequence and you're not sure if it's causing Alport syndrome or is the cause of the disease in the patient that is being tested, then another strategy is to perform genetic testing in other affected relatives if there are other affected relatives to see if they have the same change. Otherwise, you can consider other clinical factors such as in the family history, is the family history consistent with an X-linked pattern, uh, pattern of disease? That is, are males more affected than females? Um, does the person have blood in the urine to see, uh, to see what your level of suspicion is in terms of the diagnosis being Alport syndrome. So to conclude, I'll say that mutations, which I've used for ease so that, uh, and for understandability, but we actually call pathogenic variants now, in type four collagen cause Alport syndrome, which has a wide clinical spectrum that encompasses isolated blood in the urine to chronic kidney disease, hearing and eye abnormalities. And the variability in Alport syndrome is in part due to genetic factors like the number of copies of the pathogenic variant and the type of variant. An accurate diagnosis is important for monitoring, treatment, family planning, counseling, and early identification of affected relatives. So that's the conclusion of my presentation. I know the discussion prior to my presentation has a lot of the themes that I discussed, but I'm happy to answer any other questions. Well, thank you so much, Mamita, for an incredibly um, 
accessible talk. Um, I think there wasn't a slide there where I was, I was, I was searching for something. So really well done <laughs> and translating some of that for us. Um, I do have a few questions if it's possible. Um, you, you talked about this variable presentation of all thought syndrome um, between men and women. Um, what proportion of women would you say um, are go on to develop complications because of their all port syndrome um, in your at least in your experience yeah I think the literature uh, so this is something that we've looked at we really re we uh, because we're planning some future projects related to all port syndrome we really taken a deep dive into the literature mm -hmm. and one thing I'll say is that I think uh, our the reported experience is still quite limited. Um, but, and hopefully that will change as people do more and more of these types of projects. But uh, the highest percentage that I saw in one of the few papers that has been published in this domain, I believe they said up to 20% of females with X-linked Allport syndrome develop kidney failure by the age of 60. Mm -hmm. That was the highest number that I read. Wow. Um, I guess it's a sign to proactively um, make sure that you're, you're being tested and, and, and making sure that your nephrologist is aware. Um, uh, and that's a, that's a great point. And that's one of the things is that not to, because uh, I think historically in the past, like historically or in the past, uh, people have thought that females have very benign courses and never progress to kidney failure, females with X-linked Allport syndrome, but that is not the case. And so Females with X-linked Allport syndromes also need to be followed. Oh, that, that's, I think that's really useful. And it's certainly a theme that we've seen develop over the last couple of years as well. Um, my, 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 my final question really is about the final sentence on your final slide, really. We talk about early identification of relatives. Um, if I or any other Allport patient were to have children, would you recommend proactively testing um, that offspring um, so that steps can be taken in terms of care um, to mitigate potential impacts of Allport syndrome? So uh, I think it's important to have this discussion early mm -hmm. uh, before uh, having, uh, you know, even before having children, before you're starting to plan to have children. And I'm fortunate that in our clinic, we have a genetic counselor. And so all of our patients are offered genetic testing and are provided counseling uh, at the first, within the first few visits, where within the first few visits. And I have, most of my practice is young adults who have graduated from the pediatric hospital across the street from me. Um, because there are, off, so, uh, you can do genetic testing. So there are options for trying to prevent passing on the uh, genetic trait to a biologic offspring if the genetic testing uh, definitively has identified the mutation causing disease in the family. So for instance, let's say I have a, patient, let's say I have a 20 year old patient, we do genetic testing, we found the mutation. So then I speak to that patient about the, what the risk is of passing on to the to a biologic child, and then we also talk about something called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, where you can take uh, where you can create embryos using sperm and egg. You create embryos, and then you can genetically test the embryos and selectively implant embryos that don't have the mutation. Another option is you can actually do genetic testing in utero as well. Uh, and then make a decision uh, like early in pregnancy and then make a decision as to what uh, you would want to do with that information. Or finally, you don't do, I you don't do either and you do genetic testing, uh, you know, in children at some point. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that. Um, Francis, I think you probably have questions as well, right? I do, thank you very much. And as Patrick said, we can't remind people too often of the um, importance of screening women who um, have an all-port mutation on one of their two X chromosomes, or men or women who have a yeah. single yeah. mutation on one of the autosomes, because they are at increased risk of kidney problems in later life. And we know screening and early treatment of high blood pressure and a protein leak can um, help 
uh, defer some of that. Uh, just reading from a number of um, questions that have been popped up in the Q&A, uh, one question, Lumita, was how many of the patients with FSGS had had their renal biopsies looked at under the electron microscope? Um, so I think uh, the majority, if not all. Right, okay. And can yeah. you just remind us of your patients with FSGS, roughly what proportion turned out to have at least one all port mutation? All of them. They were all heterozygous. Uh, Every single patient with FSGS? Of the unrecognized all port syndrome, they were all heterozygous. Of the, so, of, the, of the. Of your group, of your patients with FSGS? Yes. Un un unexplained FSGS. Yes. What proportion turned out to have an all port mutation? Oh, 5%. 5%. 5%. Okay. Because there's been a number of studies at this, and the, and the figure does seem to vary. And I've read some studies, and indeed our lab's experiences, we picked up even an even higher proportion than that. And I certainly think it makes the case very strongly um, for the fact that we need to consider the possibility of all ports when actually clinically that's not the first thing that comes to mind. And I know patients sometimes find this confusing because they say, well, my doctor told me I have SF FSGS. And now are you telling me I've got something different? But of course, as you know, FSGS is a description of what the kidney looks like down the microscope, yeah. whereas yeah. genetic testing might help identify the underlying cause of that change in appearance of the kidney biopsy. Yes, so, I mean, FSGS is not really a diagnosis. No, that's right. It, yeah. it, it, it's a phrase that tides you over until you've found an explanation exactly. for it, isn't it? Um, one of the other questions that's popped up in the panel, um, and uh, as a nephrologist, maybe you'll be able to help us with this, is of, of people with unexplained um, chronic renal failure generally, in what proportion do we find a diagnosis and in what proportion does it remain unexplained? So um, uh, one thing about your earlier question, which ties into this question. So, uh, so in our entire cohort, we found a genetic diagnosis in 11% of the cohort. And of that 11%, half were unrecognized Allport syndrome. Right. I, do think the, I do think that the differences in genetic testing yield in these different studies is as a result of the demographics of the cohort that is being tested. So our cohort is, was largely without family history of disease. And the other thing that also impacts the genetic testing yield is the, is the criteria that you use to call something a mutation, like the disease-causing mutation. We were quite yeah. stringent. We used only mutations that had already been reported in the literature, uh, in the literature as, like, that's what we called the mutation. Mm -hmm. And, but it's possible we were missing cases. We also looked at other, uh, but likely pathogenic mutations, and that was in an additional 9% of the cohort. In terms of CK, in un, uh, like all of chronic kidney disease, the genetic testing yield, the same thing applies. It really depends on the demographics of the cohort, like what is the average age of the cohort, because genetic testing yield is much higher in younger, like in people who develop disease at a younger age. So pediatric cases, for instance, the genetic testing yield is like 80%. You'll get a, a, a genetic cause identified in 80%. But if the cohort is older, then the yield for genetic testing goes down to more similar to what, to what my experience is, is about 11 to 20%. It's not to say that there aren't genetic factors in the rest of the cohort. I think there's like much more complicated like genetic factors that are contributing and that's why we can't identify them. I'm just trying to remember in uh, Ali Garavi's paper in New England where they did an adult onset chronic kidney disease cohort, what their overall genetic testing yield was. I don't want to uh, say the wrong thing. So I, I'd have to go back and look at the actual number because that was the largest cohort with chronic kidney disease that was tested. Mm -hmm. But I think it's true to say the more genetic testing we do, the more we're finding out that even if a genetic alteration is not the sole cause of kidney problems, it can be a contributing cause. Absolutely. Yeah. And absolutely. There's, a, there's a question, I suppose, in part reflecting back to um, Konstantinos' presentation, which is about 
any possible association between diabetes and Allports. And I think you, you'll probably agree with me that Allports is not known to be associated with an increased risk of diabetes. But if you do have diabetes, whether or not you've got Allports, that does create risks for the kidney, doesn't it? Particularly if well, the diabetes I'm, is not well controlled. Well, there was a genetic study that was published in uh, Jason, which is a, like a, a prominent nephrology journal last year, where they looked at 20,000 patients with type 1 diabetes, and they looked at genetic factors that uh, associated with kidney, uh, like kidney disease, and they found that uh, a variant in collagen 4-alpha-3 was the strongest association. So I think like there can be modifiers. So you have diabetes, like you have, you know, you have this vulnerability to having kidney disease because you have a mutation in the collagen 4-alpha-3 gene. On top of it, you have diabetes and these th two things together is enough to develop. So it is more complicated in, in a lot of cases, particularly in adults, I think, with kidney disease, it is a lot more complicated than just having a single gene and a sing, you know, single gene, single disorder. That's right. So the, the, the alteration in the collagen 4 gene is not the cause of the diabetes, but if you have both the collagen 4 alteration and diabetes, there's an increased risk to your kidneys and they're functioning in, in later life. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I think... If we could um, have a, one last question, Francis, if that's okay, just so we can move on to our last I... two speakers. Sorry. Okay. What sort of um, research, or where, where, where are you going next with your research, Mamita? <laughs> um, so uh, we have a, so as a, you know, we keep finding uh, collagen mutations in our patients, not just even in FSGS. And we have found some really interesting stuff in the literature too that I hope we can uh, maybe talk about at some point. Uh, but as a result, I think that we really underappreciated the contribution of, of type four collagen to chronic kidney disease. So it has formed uh, you know, an interest of mine now, both from a uh, genetics perspective, as well as trying to understand biology, although we're kind of uh, have done more in the genetics space right now, uh, because understanding biology takes a lot of long time. Uh, but uh, so we're trying to uh, we're trying to understand these more complicated genetic uh, pictures. So that I have alluded to a couple of times in this discussion, but. Uh, uh, we're trying to understand people. We're trying to understand. Um, we're trying. We're trying to understand. I would say, like milder disease, for instance. Like, what is the difference? I had mentioned a couple of uh, genetic factors that influences the spectrum of disease, but I think there are other genetic factors that also influence the spectrum spectrum of disease. And so, uh, that's one example of what we're looking at. Thank you very much indeed. Brilliant talk. Thank you very much both. Um, I think if we, if Mamita stops sharing the screen, we can move on to our third speaker. Um, Petra, I'm so sorry for what I'm sure was a complete murder of your name earlier in the presentation. Um, Petra, are you, would you mind sharing your screen, please? Looking good, I can see that. Uh, can we hear you, more importantly? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, look, uh, perfect. When, so, whenever you're ready. Uh, so first of all, I would like to say thank you for uh, uh, giving me opportunity to present uh, uh, at this uh, event. And I will talk uh, about when genetic testing results meet kidney biopsy findings and try to show you some interesting casings from Croatian Alport Syndrome Research Group. So just something about uh, background of our project. It is titled Genotype Phenotype Polarelation in Alport Syndrome and Thin Glomerular Basement Membrane Nephropathy. It was founded by Croatian Science Foundation. It started in 2015 and the project leader is Professor Danica Galešić Dubanović, nephropathologist from Zagreb. This is our Dubrava University Hospital where our nephropathology lab is and this is School of Medicine University of Zagreb where we, when, where we perform our genetic testing. So uh, we uh, created our uh, nationwide project, which included nephrologists, pathologists, and geneticists, and other collaborators. 
And we really have to uh, give special thanks to Professor Deltas and his team for guidance and help through our research. Uh, I have to state that at the 2015, when we started our project, uh, there wasn't any genetic testing for output syndrome available in Croatia. So characteristic of our project is that initial patients were identified based on kidney biopsy findings. Then afterwards, we gathered data, performed interviews with patients, created family pedigrees, performed genetic testing and included family members, and then correlated data and created our own uh, registry of our patients. So something about uh, interesting cases, which I want to show you. So about the background of the topic, uh, as previously mentioned, alpha spectrum disorders are generally genetically heterogenic, are caused by collagen 4, AF3, AF4, or a 5 mutation, and types of mutation correlate with more severe phenotype. But there is a variability among, among patients, even within the same families, especially for, for the patients that have only one A3 or A4 mutation. So uh, patients with one uh, collagen 4A3 or collagen 4A4 mutation usually have normal or nearly normal renal fu function, but in some variable uh, proportion, as Mamita said, uh, progress to proteinuria and in-stage renal disease. Uh, finding that correlates with this uh, uh, progression in kidney biopsies is uh, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis or segmental scarring of the glomerulus, which you can see on, I don't know if you see pointer, so on the right picture. And there is also a question of additional uh, modifying factors that uh, cause that some patients uh, progress to earlier or don't. So in kidney biopsy finding in the left, you can see uh, thin glomerular basement membranes. Uh, and on the uh, right, you can see uh, classical signs of Alport syndrome, uh, thinning and thickening of glomerular basement membrane, irregular thickening and lamellation. Uh, this picture on the right, you would usually associate with classical X-linked Alport syndrome or autosomal recessive uh, Alport syndrome with two mutations. So what is interesting about our patients, there are 50 of them who on the electron microscopy have signs of classical Alport syndrome, but had only one mutation in collagen 4A3 or collagen 4A4. Uh, median age of patients was 15 years. All have blood in urine, eight had proteins in urine, two had hearing loss, and there was no ocular changes. Nine had positive family history and two of them being siblings. Uh, 14 patients had a normal renal function and the oldest one, this was 47 years old, had severe kidney function loss. And that was at the time, that was age at the time of biopsy. Uh, uh, last year she was transplanted. These are the uh, mutations we have found, uh, the black one being previously uh, described and the red ones being novel mutations. In a light microscopy findings, three patients had uh, segmental sclerosis, which is uh, shown at the upper part of the middle picture, uh, and three patients had foamy cells in kidney parenchyma, which are described to to be more usual finding in Alport syndrome, but are not specific for Alport syndrome. And only one patient had the oldest significant scarring of the kidney parenchyma. In four patients, we have had material for uh, performing staining for collagen 4A3 and A5, and uh, both showed normal uh, staining for collagen A3 and A5, which is really expected because they have only uh, one mutation. In electron microscopy, all of the patients had, in some extent, classic characteristic of Alports. 
thinning and thickening of uh, basement membrane, lamellation, and granular material in GBM. So in this picture, you can see uh, lamellation in glomerular basement membrane in that uh, oldest patient. In this, this is the female age 11 with irregular uh, thinning and thickening of a basement membrane, irregular contours and, contours and granular material. And in this picture, you can see from the male age 26, a granular material in the glomerular basement membrane. So uh, to conclude, the diagnostic process of Alport syndrome can be challenging. Uh, genetic analysis is crucial for final diagnosis, patient manage management, and uh, genetic counseling. There is variability among patients in clinical presentation, disease progression, but also renal biopsy findings. Uh, for this type of findings for, from this our cohort of 15 patients, we would expect that they have two uh, mutations uh, in collagen 4A4 or A3, or that they are extinct outwards, but they had only one mutation, which is similar to what Mamita uh, described in previous uh, talk. And uh, what are our future plans? We would like to test our patients for genetic modifiers to see if the, some genetic modifiers not only uh, 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 Con, uh, contribute to disease progression, but, but also to this renal phenotype in kidney biopsy. So this is our nephropathology theme, and this is the uh, moment of the earthquake in Zagreb, and this is the entrance of our Institute of Pathology, and so we hope that uh, this thing won't uh, slow us down. And that's all. Goodness me, what a what a picture! Um, thank you again for once again an incredibly accessible talk, um, in which I think I've, a lot of people learned a lot. How many patients do you actually have on the for, with Allport syndrome on your patient registry now in total? Uh, we have included uh, four hundred patients uh, with uh, AS or uh, thin glomerular basement membrane syndrome. Uh, but uh, yes, about 400 patients we have tested. Wow, that's quite the pull. Yes, um, what's the what's the time frame for um, genetic testing and, and, and biopsy testing before you can begin to establish a diagnosis on on the patient's end? How long would the patient expect to be waiting from the moment of uh, starting genetic testing to a possible diagnosis? Uh, 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 so th this in our country is characteristic because uh, genetic testing uh, is uh, was not performed as a healthcare process. So this was a research project that we started. Mm -hmm. So all the patients had diagnosis of the uh, based on kidney biopsy, and then we retrospectively oh, okay. Okay. contacted and tested the patients. Mm -hmm. yes. I believe that uh, uh, some kind of uh, systemic testing uh, as a part of pediatric genetics started this year okay. with some panel of uh, uh, NGS. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I'll hand it over to Francis now to uh, ask a few more questions. Thank you. This is going to seem a really cheeky question because your electron micrographs are so beautiful. The images that you've got of your um, kidneys are, are, are fabulous. But do you see a point in the future where perhaps once genetic testing becomes more widely available that doctors might turn to that as their first line test instead of doing the slightly more invasive procedure of doing a kidney biopsy? So, uh, yes, yes, I believe that uh, uh, genetic testing could be a first line of uh, diagnosis, uh, especially for the patients that have positive family history. But also, I believe we have to have in mind that people uh, can have combined uh, 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 and genetic and non-genetic uh, kidney diseases. So in some atypical cases or uh, 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 clinicians should consider 
uh, making the, the, the biopsy. So, uh, yes, I believe that in the first line, uh, if you have a, a, a positive family history and you do genetic testing and you find that it's, they have mutation, that is okay. But if you have some uh, unexpected progression or uh, additional symptoms, that, then the uh, kidney biopsies can uh, uh, reveal some uh, unexpected findings as uh, combined case of Professor Delta's showed. Okay, there's another question here for you. What are the foam cells? What, what do they mean? Uh, they are uh, um, uh, lipid-laden macrophages that have uh, uh, like foamy uh, uh, appearance and um, they, are, they, they are described usually as uh, more common in all ports, but they are, they, are, uh, they are often with uh, higher, often present in biopsies with higher proteinuria. So they don't point to a specific diagnosis? No, they are not specific for Alport, yes. Not in the same way that seeing those thickened, and when you talk about the laminated GBM, it's the fact that it's got little strands in it. It's sort of splitting up into layers, isn't it? Yes. A bit like puff yes. pastry. Okay, let me just scan through and see if there's any other questions. No, I think you've answered all your questions. That was a fantastic and very clear talk. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much both. Uh, we're going to move on to our final talk now, uh, Christophorus. Um, would you mind sharing your screen now, please? Do you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. I'm just waiting on the screen share. Okay, we can see it. Not full screen yet. Banging, fantastic. Um, whenever you're ready. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I am Christophoros from uh, Professor Delta, Professor Delta's lab. And my talk is about uh, our first results uh, after Chaberon treatment of Alport mice. Alport syndrome is a severe inherited glomerulopathy characterized by progressive kidney disease combined um, by hearing impairment and ocular defects. Sorry. Um, clinical features uh, include uh, hematuria, progressive nephritis with proteinuria, and declining renal fluxion, uh, which can lead to end stage renal disease at early age. All cases of Alport syndrome arise from mutations in genes encoding the alpha chains of type 4 collagen. In mature glomeruli, uh, the glomerular basement membrane is mainly composed from, of uh, alpha-3, alpha-4, and alpha-5 chains. And in humans, the distal tubular basement membranes are also positive for the, the, for the three chains, but in mice, the full range of TBMs. Alport mice have been widely used to study the pathogenesis of Alport syndrome and to develop effective therapies. Uh, regarding the Colfer A3 gene, there are two knockout mouse models uh, that were created in 1996 and uh, recapitulate uh, the severe symptoms of the Alport syndrome. However, about half of Alport patients have missense mutations with zinc amino acid substitutions of glycine being the most common. Uh, and again, mouse model was created recently by our group uh, by making a point mutation at the 1332 in call for a 3 to recapitulate the heterozygous mutation at 1334 in humans, uh, which causes TBMN. The homozygous mutant mice uh, showed activation of the unfolded protein response UPR due to ER stress in glomerular isolates. So our first aim was to completely characterize the kinase phenotype of two mouse models, the Nogin mouse that carries the point mutation at 1332 in city, and a compound heterozygous mouse that carries the same mutation with a call for a three knockout allele. And uh, the second uh, mouse model can be used as uh, for studying um, analogous uh, mutations in collagen for and genes that were reported before in many uh, output patients. So the um, lifespan of both mutant mice was significantly shorter compared to controls. 
the GBM of both mutants um, exhibited uh, the alternate uh, thickening and thinning uh, in, in, in the Nogin mice and the combated residuous mice. Uh, this also caused the, uh, an increase to albuminuria uh, that uh, reached uh, high levels uh, in older mice. And also we noticed the uh, um, intermediate uh, microscopic hematuria. Additionally, the serum creatinine, creatinine and, and serum urea uh, will reach high levels in uh, a number of nogin mice. Additionally, a moderate uh, to severe diffuse and uh, glomerular sclerosis and vestigial fibrosis was noticed in uh, both mutant mice. And also, uh, some uh, fibrous markers like TGT beta 1 and ACTA 2 were upregulated uh, in Western blood assays. Um, additionally, the expression of the three. Uh, uh, alpha chains, the alpha 3, alpha 4, and alpha 5, were um, examined in kidney sections from uh, mutants. And we noticed that in tubules, uh, the expression of the three chains is reduced uh, in combat and residuous mice and in login mice. And additionally, the expression in uh, glomeruli it looked uh, normal. Uh, in order to examine uh, if the mutant um, corfery trees uh, secreted normally in the GBM. We performed a double immunofluorescent assays with a, a basement membrane market laminin. And we found that in uh, mutant mice, uh, the mutant uh, R corfery tree is secreted normally in the GBM. This was confirmed using a protocyte marker synaprobotin and found that and uh, the mutant alpha-3 is uh, secreted in the GBM. Uh, the reduction of the three chains in the TBM was uh, confirmed by Western blood assays uh, by using protein from whole kidney isolates. But in glomeruli isolates, we found that the, even though we have the expression of the three chains, uh, uh, there is a cleavage probably in um, in the region of the mutation and we, uh, all the three chains a3 a4 and alpha 5 are cleaved and they give a 35 kilo dalton fragment so the second aim was to propose uh, fta approved chemical chaberons to the rescue of the mouse mondel of alcohol syndrome uh, chemical chaberons are low molecular weight compounds known to stabilize protein conformation, improve ER folding capacity, facilitate the trafficking of mutant proteins, and alleviate ER stress in dust apoptosis and other diseases. So we used two uh, synthetic chaberons, the 4PBA and TUTCA, that both proved beneficial and were approved by FDA in other disease indications to treat output mice with the hope to rescue or improve their phenotype. So uh, for this project, we separated our mice in three groups. The first group uh, consisted by mutant mice, the compound heterozygous mice, and wild type mice that were treated with the 4PBA. The second group uh, consisted by mice that were treated with Tutka. And the third the group uh, were treated with the vehicle that was PBS. We, we performed um, a short treatment for two months and the long term uh, treatment for six months that were the, the both uh, Chaberos and the PBS were administered uh, intraperitoneally. And also a third treatment was uh, last for 12 months by adding the Chaberos and the PBS in drinking water. Just note that the treatment, the dose uh, for, of Chaberos for the sixth month treatment was double compared with the other two treatments. So here are the pictures on the electron microscope. And uh, after six months of chaperone administration, as you can see in wild type mice, uh, the chaperone uh, did not affect at all the GBM, was normal. The PBS treated mice um, 
uh, were showed that the GBM had, had characteristic alternate thickening and thinning. Now, in chaverons, um, for the Tutka treated mice, the GBM was comparable with the PBS treated mice having the um, uh, characteristic thickening and thinning. But in four PBA treated mice, uh, we found that the defects of the GBM were decreased compared with the other uh, uh, groups. A collaborator in Crete, uh, Dr. Stiliano, uh, which is, a, is, a, is an experienced uh, nephro nephrologist, uh, made many measurements uh, from several mice from each group and um, found that there is a 43% reduction of lesions in the GBM of four PBA treated mice. And additionally, uh, there, there was a significant decline of the lesion severity uh, also in the JBM of the four PBA treated mice. And based on preliminary results, we found that the hematuria was reduced in, uh, in four PBA treated mice. And also we noticed a slight decrease of the serum urea in uh, four PBA treated mice. So uh, we described here two mouse models of Alport syndrome uh, that carry a substitution mutation and re recapitulate clinical and pathologic features of the disease. And also the long-term administration of 4PBA could effectively restore to sufficient degree the thickness of the GBM in the mutant mice when compared with control mice. Uh, just to let you know here that in, in, we examined the, the electron microscope uh, studies showed that the significant uh, changes in the GBM was were noticed in the long-term treatments of the six months and the 12 month treatments. The two months didn't show any significant change in the GBM. And so we have uh, in the future many uh, work, to, much work to do with uh, regarding proteinuria levels, uh, creatinine levels, kidney fibrosis in the mutants that were receiving the chaperons. Also, we will examine the lifespan and the expression of the three chains of uh, collagen 4. And we plan also to administer the chaperons to the other mouse model, the Nogin mice. And I would like to thank all, all of you for hearing. Christopher, um, we've got a bunch of questions popping up in the Q and A channel. Keep um, keep firing them at us. Um, I think I think the question that always seems to come up when we have presentations about drug trials, um, even on animals, is what the what the prospects of moving forward to um, human tests would be, um, whether there would be a time frame between um, having successful tests, which we relatively successful tests, which we've seen in the presentation and having them being used on humans. What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think that uh, maybe we have uh, good results after clin uh, the clinical study because the main uh, feature of the output syndrome is the defects in the GBM. If you fix the, the defects in the GBM, I think uh, the phenotype of uh, the syndrome maybe it will change. So uh, I think uh, this is a positive result for the future. And um, I think that the other, um, when we check the expression of the collagens, if these chaperons uh, not only uh, help the protein to uh, fold uh, properly and also help it to traffic to the GBM, to the GBM and secrete it. Uh, I think it will be very novel for the, um, for the future treatment of the Alport syndrome. And also this chaperon, sorry, it's uh, were also used for other diseases in the past and were used in patients for other diseases and we know which concentrations are toxic for the patient. So here, when we um, try to, um, to find the correct concentrations to do, give to the mice, um, we check all the literature for uh, those uh, using the two chaperons and we are um, wanted to give the, 
the doses, the concentrations are not toxic based on previous results. And we, so um, we check for two different uh, doses, a low dose and a high dose. And we found that the long-term uh, treatment, uh, even in a low uh, dose or the high dose was um, beneficial. It's, it's really exciting to see not just that it was able to maintain existing um, GBM thickness, but also to restore it, <laughs> um, which is um, good news, I think, for patients that are relatively long down the line. Um, this is a really dumb question, and, and, and bear with me, but it did come up in the Q&A panel. Are you having to control for sex when you do testing on mice? Because yes. we know that there are presentations. Yes, are, yes. You, are you testing on specifically um, male or female mice, or are you, uh, do you have a, a, a mix? We, we added both, uh, also female and male mice, but uh, you have... Um, in uh, core 43 uh, mutations, I think it's not a matter of uh, the sex because um, based on our results, uh, we didn't see any difference between male or female uh, mice. Got it. Thank you very much. Francis, over to you for the uh, final Q&A. Thank you. So I'm sure patients will be intrigued to hear that you can actually cause a specific mutation in a mouse in order to then do some tests to find out what which potential drugs might be useful. Why did you choose that particular mutation? Uh, in core 43? Mm. And because here in Cyprus, uh, it's uh, many patients uh, have in heterozygosity this mutation. The um, 1334 from glycine to glutamate. It's a common mutation here in Cyprus. It's a common mutation in Cyprus, likely. So many people likely to be descended from the yeah. same person if they have the same mutation. Yeah. And th there's a question about what age you start treating these mice. Do they effectively ah. need to be treated from birth or can mm. you wait till they're the, the mouse equivalent of teenagers or older before you start? Yes, we, uh, we started uh, at 2.5 to 3 months of life. It's, a, it's the, based on previous characterization of the phenotype, we noticed that the symptoms began after the third month of life of the of the mice, so uh, we began just a little just before the emergence of the symptoms. So uh, what what's that equivalent to in human years? Um, I'm, I don't remember now. <laughs> I made it before. <laughs> I don't remember now the age exactly. Um, no. I mean, I suppose from a first principles point of view, you'd expect a drug like that that has an effect on the, the structure of the basement membrane to be most useful if it, it started early in life, before the damage to yes, the cancer in the kidney. Before we have uh, the damage in the GBM, yes. Yes. And what sort can of I, side effects... Can I make a comment here? Oh, I'm sorry. Please. I'm sorry can I make a comment here? Uh, yeah, well... We, we, even though we are really excited with these preliminary results, they are still preliminary. And Chris and, and, and the student working on this project are very interested in extending this project until we see differences on the lifespan of the, of the animals. And these uh, ultrastructural and histological promising results are very exciting indeed, but unless we see improvement on, on the lifespan we are we are uh, you know hesitant to to be very happy about it but in, on the previous question i would like to make a comment relating to why this mutation well as, as chris said it's, it's a very frequent mutation in cyprus i mean we have more than i don't know more than 200 patients with this single mutation and going back to the presentation by uh, Dr. Barua Mumida, uh, relating to the FSGS in output, this one mutation was the one that we found in nearly 10 families with 80 patients, nearly 80 patients, who had FSGS. And initially, we thought this was autosomal dominant FSGS. And we were really excited. We, we actually even got a, a new grant based on the fact that we were studying FSGS families because this was the primary initial diagnosis. And it turned out that all of them had thin basement membrane nephropathy because of heterozygous mutations. 
This is the kind of patient that some people would call autosomal dominant Alpert syndrome. This is just for history, going back 20 years, nearly 20 years. So the, the chaperone treatment might actually be useful for patients, um, not just those who've got um, mutations in all ports genes, but do you think it might be useful for patients with FSGS for, of other causes? It, it could be actually. It could be that, as, as you know very well, we have a fair amount of patients who are heterozygous and they present with this autosomal domino alpha syndrome or severe progressive thin bed membrane nephropathy. So we all agree by now that thin bed membrane nephropathy is not a benign disease. Therefore, we, have, we do have many patients who, who are on dialysis or they are transplanted because of these heterozygous mutations who were initially diagnosed as focal and segmental glomerulosclerosis. And it turned out to be a collagen for mutation. Yeah. So yeah, if if the, if this treatment turns out to be real, affecting even the improving the lifespan, it might be worth doing a clinical trial, considering the safety knowledge and the approval uh, as a repurpose drug, uh, as Chris said. Mm. Um, and what are the key side effects that the chaperones cause? What's the main toxicity? Can I talk? Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some, uh, uh, they refer that uh, they have stomach uh, pain or vomiting for if they have, uh, they are getting high doses of uh, chaperones. And, about, uh, and this is uh, the same for the PBA, for PBR and for Tutka. Okay, yeah. and it looked as if some of your mice were getting them by injection and some were very sweetly drinking it with a straw out of the glass. Um, is it a drug that can be given by either route? Does it make any difference how it's administered? Uh, based on the results, we, uh, there is no difference. Uh, those who that were receiving uh, intraperitoneally uh, for six months uh, showed the significant uh, changes in GPM and also those that were getting in drinking water for 12 months showed the same result. Okay. Uh, yes. And you've obviously got a beautiful animal model here. Are you testing any other drugs on, on it as well? Not, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long uh, period now because uh, you ha we had to inject a, a, a huge number of mice every day for the six months and uh, it was uh, a little difficult <laughs> so in the future maybe if we find something interesting maybe we'll check it but your results are very striking and certainly the the um, pictures of the electromicrographs of the kidney biopsies are uh, uh, yes. remarkably convincing aren't they yeah sure and the measurements that uh, dr constant estiliano made uh, were very uh, positive okay um Martin Gregory has just typed an interesting well, sort of question statement in the Q&A here, which I'm, I'm going to read out because it, you may want to comment on it. It may be that Dr. Baru and Dr. Sengju do as well. Um, he says, in the older pathology literature, there are descriptions of lamination typical of Alport syndrome to a mild degree in patients with a wide variety of other glomerular diseases. In other words, to some degree of overlap. The conclusion was that one should be wary of diagnosing Alport syndrome based on minor GBM changes if there was evidence of other pathology. Perhaps this needs to be re-examined to clarify the significance of GBM changes in patients with other glomerular diseases. We could be making errors in both directions, concluding that changes are significant of Allport syndrome when there are not, or discarding GBM changes as incidental. Would any of the speakers from today like to comment on that? Um, I can I can uh, start because uh, that's uh, that's something that we've uh, kind of you know our thinking behind this has evolved over time as we've um, done genetic testing on more and more uh, individuals. So I would say that I think pathology, while is a uh, useful test, is a is a you know qualitative test. It's a descriptive. It's a description of uh, how the injury looks under the microscope, and so. Uh, but at the same time, genetic testing also is not a, you know, a black or white definitive answer in all, in all, you know, whenever we perform it. 
uh, there's a lot of, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of areas of gray. I think you can increase the um, interpretation of each test if you do both of them together. So if you see someone who has glomerular basement membrane abnormalities and you do genetic testing uh, and you find a, a variant in one of the collagen genes and the, clinic, the rest of the clinical picture fits with the diagnosis, that is a situation that is not uncommon that we see that you need multiple tests to kind of raise the suspicion of uh, Allport syndrome. You know, we see a lot of variants of uncertain significance in genetic, in our genetic testing as well. So, uh, but if we have pathology that shows glomerular basement membrane abnormalities and there are multiple family members with hematuria or blood in the urine, then I say to myself, okay, I think this is all port syndrome. So not one test, I, uh, my thinking right now is that not one test alone is sufficient to make the diagnosis necessarily, that the interpretation of all tests together and the clinical features together helps with the diagnosis. I completely agree with you and it, it, it also emphasizes the value of having a multidisciplinary team, doesn't it, to which your pathologists, nephrologists, geneticists and so on can all contribute. Yes. Um, it's a bit like doing a very complicated jigsaw puzzle. One looks for clues in all sorts of different places and then sometimes you're lucky and suddenly you can tell what the picture in the puzzle is and sometimes you need to carry on looking for a very long time. Yes. Have any of our other speakers, speakers uh, want to comment on that? Uh, yes, I would like to comment. So. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so we have uh, we have a few cases of uh, in our project patients that had classical signs of Alport syndrome on electron microscopy, and we didn't find mutation on the NGS panel. So uh, we are not sure because we are testing only for for a three, four, and five. We are, we are not sure if that are some phenocopies or of other genetic disorders on what, what's in genetic background, or, or if NGS skipped some, uh, missed some, some mutations. Uh, also, we have uh, 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 some patients that have thin basement membranes on uh, electron microscopy uh, with no positive uh, uh, family history, and we have tested them, and we, they, we also didn't find uh, uh, we also didn't find mutations, so so there is a, a, a necessity for the correlation of uh, both methods. I think that's a great that's a great uh, point because we also find that too, where we're suspicious for Allport syndrome, and then we do genetic testing, and we haven't and we don't find anything uh, as well. And I and I don't uh, those cases are much more difficult. Uh, uh, to, to really know what the diagnosis is. But like you point out, I think uh, gen next generation, it depends on the test, the genetic testing you did as well, uh, because next generation sequencing can miss uh, deletion. It might not, it, it doesn't, if you're just doing coding sequence, you're not going to look, you're not going to see intronic variants. Who knows what to do with intronic variants anyways. So, um, it might be also that there's a genetic factor, but we just don't know how to interpret it. Indeed. One of the other questions that's come up in the Q&A is how often does a false diagnosis occur? And of course, we don't know how often we're getting it wrong, but I think one of the things that we've learned is that um, rather than stopping when you have found an answer, what current research is showing us is that there are often other contributory factors as well. And if you carry on looking, you'll find more things. Um, but you do need to be careful sometimes not to ascribe more importance to an unusual finding than perhaps it deserves because that may be uh, actually an irrelevance and we're still all on a very steep learning curve. Okay. Patrick, yeah. I'm conscious of the fact that we've hit our target time. Um, we've had four phenomenal presentations this evening and some very interesting questions. We've tried to pick up as many of them as we can while we go along, but some of them we may have to answer um, in writing afterwards. But can I hand back to you to thank our speakers, please? It's been an absolute privilege. I think we've had an incredibly um, um, strong workshop, especially after Dominic last week, but it, it, it's just been so fascinating. Um, I have to say, uh, I haven't seen a, a, someone that isn't my family in 
about three months, but I'm, I'm the most informed about my condition I think I've ever been. <laughs> um, thank you everyone for, for, for submitting your words. Um, I think all that remains for me to do really is to close it up. Thank you very much for joining us today and giving us your feedback. Thank you to Archie for jumping in at the last minute and helping manage all the mics. Thank you to Harriet for organizing all of this behind the scenes, bringing all the speakers together. Um, of course, I want to thank our speakers and our guest moderator, Francis, um, for putting the time in today to educate us. I think this workshop, more than others that we've had before, was completely international um, in its scope. And um, I saw people in the chat from uh, as far away as India and Japan as well, um, which, is, which is so inspiring for me as a patient. Um, and I, I want to I want to keep that international trend going um, as COVID becomes less of a threat in some countries. A massive thank you to Kidney Research UK for their sponsorship. The community really appreciates the contribution that you're making to help us understand our condition and connect up such incredible scientists. We hope you'll be able to join us at the next session on the 24th of June. That's going to be a spotlight on the Minor Lab in St. Louis. We've been building up to this for several weeks now and I cannot wait. Um, so do make sure you join us same time, same day on the 24th of June. If you have any more feedback about this session or want to be added to our mailing list, you can do so at research at allport.org. That's our email, research at allport.org. You can also follow us on other social media. Patients can join the Allport Warriors Facebook group run by the amazing Norma Calderwood. And you can also hit us up on our Twitter page to hear about workshops and other stuff. And uh, that's at Allport UK on Twitter, Allport UK. If you missed anything today or want to have another look at the topic we discussed, we will share the video of our session within the week, hopefully, uh, on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. Um, we'll also put out an invite for the next workshop through our email address. I hope you have an amazing evening wherever you're tuning in from. Um, and please stay safe. We'll see you in two weeks. Bye-bye.